are German bombers in a movie about some British kids escaping the war into a mythical realm. Do we really need Sky Captain in the world of yesterday footage of these bombers? Maybe this is why the movie is 2 hours 23 minutes long. This scene is meant to explain why Peter, Susan, Edmund, and Lucy end up in that manner with the wardrobe in it. Granted, we don't see it in the book, it's just explained, but this is a movie and they clearly want to show it visually. This is a pretty good case of show, don't tell. This intense opening is meant to give us context, but it also builds a connection to their home and their mother that the movie will never revisit or resolve for its entire two and a half hours. Okay, so I don't disagree with the statement about the mother, but you just flat out mentioned that this cold opening is meant to give us context. So what was that previous sin all about? These two sins clearly contradict each other. <laughs> Why can't you like anyone but yourself? You're so selfish. You could have got us killed. You know what else could get you killed, Peter? Leaving that bunker door open just so you can chastise your little brother. Shut the door. He does. You could have got us killed. Stop it. You just do as you're told. When boarding a train, please make sure to inform us if you are starring in a film so you can be seated by a window on the station side for maximum waving effect. Thank you and enjoy your evacuation. So, the sin here is that the Pevensey kids happen to be on the side of the train where their mother is so they can wave at her. I just have two words to ask. So what? You will listen to your brother, won't you, Edmund? <laughs> this laugh. Be a big girl. Okay, I will, but, um, do you mean emotionally, like Dakota Fanning and Man on Fire? Or do you mean physically, like 80s Monica on Friends? Or do you mean spiritually, like that whale rider chick? Jeremy makes three pop culture references that aren't a sin of the movie cliche. Movie isn't the screw tape letters. Okay, what's the sin? Both the line of Witch in the Wardrobe and its screw tape letters were written by C.S. Lewis. That's something wrong with this movie? Mrs. McCready? I'm afraid so. Movie spends so much time Oliver twisting and Anne of Green Gabling, I'm beginning to wonder if it's ever going to go Narnia Chronically. Jeez, you're really pulling out all the pop culture references for this one, aren't you? And above all, there shall be no disturbance of the professor. Oh, now I understand this too long setup. They're hoping to create a Narnia-verse, which I guess they kind of do for another movie or two. I don't know. I forget how it all worked out. Oh no! The movie is world building! Sin it! Sin it! Is it Latin? Yes. Is it Latin for worst game ever invented? Edmund is such a miserable whiny little bastard, always correcting everyone and pointing out the mistakes and hey! You showed a clip of Edmund being annoyed with his siblings and you then say he's correcting or pointing out mistakes? Also, this is the 10th sin, and so far you haven't pointed out a single legit error. Random and convenient completely empty chest is both random and convenient. Why is that so unbelievable? This is a big house, there's only a couple of people living here. You expect literally every single chest to be full of something? And how is it random? She ran through at least two hallways and is at the far end of this room with the door closed. I doubt she's hearing Peter at all. Finally! A legit sin! Took you long enough. Maybe you should have made this video like five minutes long so you can skip all the nonsense and point out all the actually wrong things in this movie. Oh wait, that would mean the video would get less views, huh? Lucy accidentally herself into Narnia. Yeah, so? Nobody in the regular world even knows about Narnia except the professor. How else would they get in? And considering this movie is based off of a book that is pretty much Christian fan fiction, you can instead interpret it as destiny. Is wandering into a fantasy world a common occurrence for Lucy? She doesn't seem shocked or scared at all that this closet led to some sort of winter wonderland. How is she at least not running back the way she came at this point to inspect what happened? She looks pretty shocked to me. Also, she's a kid. Her instinct to explore the wintry forest to see how big it is is exactly the kind of thing a kid would do. <laughs> Yes, Lucy, be very afraid. I've seen what James McAvoy does when he's in beast mode, and you don't want any part of it. Yes, I know. James McAvoy also played the beast in Split. Did you know that Tilda Swinton also played the Ancient One in the MCU? Jim Broadbent was also Professor Slughorn in the Harry Potter films? Liam Neeson was also Brian Mills in Taken? 
wise actors being in multiple movies a sin. From from the lamppost all the way to Castle Care Paravel on the Eastern Ocean. Every stick and stone you see is Narnia. Fun explaining. Do I even need to explain? How would it be? If you came and had tea with me. Well, it would be sort of like a kidnapping and an Amber Alert would be issued. Lucy accepts the half-naked stranger's invite to tea, further ignoring her siblings and how many rules of hide-and-seek she's breaking. This entire movie's events could be avoided if Lucy would just act her age and get scared of the snowscape and goat stranger and run back through the wardrobe into the mansion. Well, she does hesitate at first, but Mr. Tumnus has seen pretty nice so far, so there's no reason Lucy can see to not trust him. You say she's not acting her age, but this is 100% realistic. What the f***? It's like, hey, come to my house for tea, then psychedelic fluting. Mr. Tumnus is trying to lull Lucy to sleep so he can take her to the White Witch. You would know that if you let the next couple of minutes play. If she knows she's going back to Narnia, wouldn't she do more to prepare than just slide some boots on? Maybe a jacket? A hat? Some fawn repellent? I guess I can buy those suggestions. Except for the fawn repellent. Did you not see the friendship building between Lucy and Tumnus? Anything you'd like to eat. Turkish delight? Sheesh. First Tumnus traps Lucy in and Fire Flute roofies her. Now, a discount collateral here is basically running a Hey Kid Wants Some Candy on it. Because Edmund is a kid and the White Witch is a villain? I don't see the problem here. You must assume she's telling the truth. Old, goofy, and confusing guy who likes to smoke a pipe gives the small hero's advice while seemingly just babbling about gibberish. Again, I'm not sure who got there first, but it's clear as day Lewis and Tolkien were writing their famous fantasies at the exact same time. It would be nice if he gave a little bit more information than that. I think you're trying to compare Narnia to Lord of the Rings, so I think that would mean you're comparing the professor here to Gandalf. If so, are you suggesting Gandalf is goofy? Because I don't remember him being goofy in the slightest. The only other character I can think of that you might be comparing him to is Bilbo, but I don't remember him giving any wise advice, so I genuinely don't know what you're trying to say here. Snowball fight? Really? It's your first time in a magical land fully contained inside a wardrobe. Not your first time seeing snow, you f***ing dolts. You really don't understand kids, do you? He's a beaver. He shouldn't be saying anything. Susan would be excellent at anthropomorphisms. Are you saying Susan is correct in her statement that animals shouldn't talk? In freaking Narnia? Fish and chips. <laughs> Hmm, large dam, element of danger, talking beavers, sardines. This movie has most of my sexual fantasies all rolled into one scene. What? Who's Aslan? Who's Aslan? <laughs> you cheeky little blighter. Why would Beaver think that they knew this and were joking? He knows they're not from here, right? Mr. Beaver doesn't know anything about the regular world, and Aslan did create Narnia. I think he probably just assumed that he was so famous that everyone in the universe would know him. It's time the four of us were getting home. Ed? That damn room is in no damn way big enough for Edmund to have made his damn escape without being seen. Considering they were all deep in conversation when Edmund left... Do I even need to finish this sentence? These doors seem a bit impractical. This is the castle of a freaking witch. Tell me I have to explain that one, too. Edmund is a punk-ass little bitch. Already ditched his family at a race to the obviously evil queen because she has some candy. Walks through a field of statues that, to me, the casual observer, are clearly Medusa-style frozen real creatures, and draws glasses and a mustache on one. F Edmund. This movie should have been called Chronicles of Narnia. Edmund is a ponce. You're sinning characterization. This is who Edmund is. And by the end of the movie, he'll become a much nicer person. That is pretty much every single character arc ever. Also, that cringy British accent. <laughs> Movie cheats like my college girlfriend here and it makes me furious because the kids and beaver are already gone when the wolves show up. But to keep the audience surprised, they edited the footage to make it look like the wolves had shown up before they got away. Basically, they edited this with the editorial hand of a Keeping Up With The Kardashian show. I am struggling to see the problem here. This movie is doing a common thing in a lot of movies called subverting expectations, where it makes you think the wolves have cornered them before revealing they got away. Why is that something wrong with this movie? This barrel is A, too small to cover the opening, B, too light to not easily be moved, and C, rollable. This in no way betters their predicament. And the movie is aware of that because the wolves push it out of the way later. <laughs> Aslan's camp is near the stone table. 
just across the frozen river. Awesome. How the f*** do you know that? Your own wife was shocked a few minutes ago to meet a fox that had met Aslan. Yeah, you know the exact route and location of the secret camp. What? How is Mr. Beaver knowing the route to Aslan's table and Mrs. Beaver being shocked that the fox has met Aslan even remotely connected? Here's a jump scare chase scene that has all the tension of a genuinely scary moment, except that it ends with Santa Claus. Yep, Santa Claus. Has a movie ever jumped the shark at its own halfway point? Another subverting expectation sin. I am genuinely running out of things to say. Santa gives each human child a special gift, a la The Wizard of Oz, and I'm suddenly starting to wonder if C.S. Lewis was just really good at paying close attention to other works of fiction that capture the public's imagination. There is one big difference between this scene and the gift-giving scene in The Wizard of Oz. In that movie, the gifts were given to fix their biggest character flaws, here, it's to help them on their quest to free Narnia from the witch's rule. Also, it would have been hilarious if he gave three of them cool swords and helmets and but then gave the last one a lame gift, like, Aw oh, man, socks! I have a feeling, even if the movie did do that, you would question why Father Christmas would do it. What is happening right now? The kids and beavers need to cross the river before the ice melts, the wolves trap them, and Peter decide that, instead of killing the wolf captain, he will push his sword into the ice and help himself and his sisters to hold onto the ice cap as they get it washed away. How is any of that difficult to understand? Which slap? <laughs> Look, this is a massively super huge army gathered here, where Aslan apparently is. And yet the Ice Queen knew nothing of Aslan's return or his location until Edmund told her. God, she has the worst informant. Or Aslan's people are good at making sure the witch doesn't notice them, especially considering they've been here their whole life. This unexplained centaur makes a lot more sense than the one in Bright. Not only does he say that something in this movie makes more sense than another movie, he also indicates that this centaur needs explaining, whatever that means. Welcome Peter, son of Adam. Even in 2005, Liam Neeson as Aslan was a bit of casting that was too on the nose. Sending Liam Neeson as Aslan, that's worth 10 cents. The evil king that torments Edmund for fun. My question is, why did they keep him alive? And even if keeping him alive has a good excuse, why did they bring him along into battle? They kept him alive just in case he has more information about Aslan. Also, what battle? He's currently tied up while the White Witch is gathering her forces and preparing for battle. Susan! There is no way Susan covered that amount of ground that quickly and got a blow on that horn before being turned into a wolf chow. Why? You just made a random claim without any proof behind it and you think we're gonna buy it just because you said so? Is it just me or does Peter have a bad case of the wobbly sword? Considering Peter literally just got this sword like a few hours ago and has never wielded it before... Narnia's not going to run out of toast, Dad. Okay, but where does Narnian toast come from? Where does the flour come from? Why is the bread so evenly cut? Do you toast it on a campfire? It's not like Aslan can buy the bread down at the local food line. Do you know how long bread has been around? And sure, they toasted it with fire. Why is that even a question? The older sibling takes one turn practicing archery. And because it was Santa that gave her this gear, she ends up being awesome at it and doesn't even need the practice. Says Susan is automatically awesome at this bow while showing her missing the center of the target. Yay, <laughs> My name is Philip. If the sequel to this film had been about the life and times of Philip the Horsey, they'd still be making Narnia movies today. A few things here. Firstly, I'm guessing you're referencing the next book chronologically speaking, being the horse and his boy, but the next movie they made, Prince Caspian, is the next book that C.S. Lewis published, and they needed to get that out first because the kids need to be around the same age. Secondly, the horse in that book is named Bree, not Philip, or at least that's his nickname. Thirdly, the reason they stopped making Narnia movies is because of copyright issues. They forgot to renew the contract before it expired. Everyone got up and reacted before she even disturbed the curtain and walked out. These two scenes are happening at the same time. How do I know your promise will be kept? Apparently this roar is Magic Jesus lying for bitch please. More like Aslan is just telling her to not question his word, especially considering he earlier chastised her for recapping the rules of Narnia because he was there when they were written. The Passion of the Lion. This movie dwells and lingers on the Jesus character's death even more than the Bible does. Jesus, I mean, sorry. Holy Christ, I mean... Wow! These two sins are saying the same thing. So one sin for padding the sin count, and another sin for you stating the obvious allegory to Jesus' death and resurrection, and that not being a sin of this movie. It's too late. He's gone. 
How does Susan know this? I mean, did she take some sort of lion life science class back at Finchley High? She didn't even take his pulse. Yes, Jeremy. Let's just ignore the knife that the witch thrust into Aslan's body. Surely he could have survived that. Why is this even allowed? Why did the Ice Queen kill Aslan but tell her entire army to peace out and leave that lion body here for others to mourn him or for him to come back to life, which he's obviously going to do? Another three things. One, they left because they need to get ready for the big battle that's about to take place. Two, the witch didn't even know that Susan and Lucy were watching, so she wouldn't have needed to worry about anybody mourning him. And three, the witch also didn't know about the deeper magic that brought Aslan back to life, so she really thought Aslan was dead for good. We have to tell the others. We can't just leave him. Lucy, there's no time. Susie Smarty Pants actually has a good point here. They just heard the White Witch say she's coming to kill them all. So maybe cut the Beaster morning short a bit and go give your buddies a heads up. Trees. Tree mail. I was gonna say that they were gonna use the trees to send a message that Aslan is dead, but then you showed that clip proving that you already know that, making that first sin completely pointless. Seriously, how is it you wrote that second sin and didn't realize that it messes with your first sin? Thank God they escaped the dangers of World War II. Considering they go on to become kings and queens of Narnia. Yeah, thank Aslan that they escaped the dangers. At least four straight minutes of battle shit I've seen done better by more than one film or franchise. The point is that this film's biggest sin is repetitive blandness. Bland? This battle is bland? Way too much time spent with Aslan explaining the table, the markings, and does anyone else remember there's a battle going on right now? Aslan is explaining how he was able to come back to life. You know, a crucial plot point that would feel arbitrary if it wasn't explained. Generic, we would have done it better battle footage. This is pretty much the exact same sin about this battle being bland. Have I mentioned that CinemaSins likes to pad the sin count? Good to see Wakanda sent some help. Yes because Black Panther invented rhinos. Obviously. I give you Queen Lucy. Skip. Skip this really fulfilling moment? Yeah, okay. In fact, let me play this fulfilling outro to show that I finally finished watching this trash video.